Egypt's pyramids. The greatest of these monuments was the tallest structure on Earth for over 4,000 years. They contain gigantic stone blocks, weighing up to 70 tons. Yet they were made by a society that didn't even possess the wheel. Now, Egyptian pyramids on modern marvels. Inside the famous Great Pyramid of Khufu at Giza, a series of mysterious passageways lead through the Mountain of Stone. Passing through a magnificent grand gallery, the main passageway finally ends at a granite-lined vault deep within the massive structure. Called the King's Chamber, many scholars believe that this is where the Great Khufu was finally laid to rest. But was he? For centuries, these extraordinary edifices have inspired an enduring fascination in people around the world. Generations have wanted to see them, study them, and unlock their age-old secrets, such as why and exactly how they were built. And yet, despite the best efforts of researchers, the solutions to many questions surrounding the pyramids remain tantalizingly obscure. The lack of concrete evidence from ancient Egyptian sites has complicated the problem. Even the application of the most modern technology has failed to unravel all the mysteries. Recently, however, new theories have been proposed, which call some of the key generally accepted ideas about the pyramids into question, and that may indeed solve some of the riddles concerning these magnificent achievements. One of the first mysteries about the pyramids is their exact number. Nearly 100 have been discovered in Egypt. Surprisingly, however, at least three pyramids that are mentioned in inscriptions remain obscured by time and the relentless desert sands. It may seem surprising that pyramids have not been located yet, but over thousands of years, their superstructures may have been quarried away and all that's left is underground or may have been built over. Built during a span of almost a thousand years, from approximately 2630 to 1640 BC, the pyramids stand as cultural and engineering marvels of staggering proportions. Not only are they incredibly magnificent structures, but of course they're also the few uh, uh, wonders of the ancient world to survive. The purpose of the pyramid is to serve as the king's tomb, but that's only the beginning because we have to understand why the king of Egypt needed to have a tomb quite like that. The uh, pyramid is the architectural realization of the king's ascent to the sun. That was the king's after-death fate. The pyramid is the spot in which that great transformation takes place in which the king is reborn. An ancient Arab proverb reads, man fears time, but time fears the pyramids. And yet the so-called golden age of pyramid building lasted for only 150 years during the fourth dynasty of the Egyptian Old Kingdom. And the greatest of the pyramids, those on the Giza Plateau near Cairo, were constructed over a span of only three generations. Remarkable engineering achievements in their own right, the pyramids were also the centerpieces of often vast complexes of temples and smaller tombs called necropolis. The word necropolis literally means city of the dead. So with the pyramid itself, we only have the monument over the king's tomb. Attached to the pyramid is a temple. Then there's a long causeway that leads to the valley where there's another temple. Offerings are presented at the statues of the king in this temple. There is enormous staff that's involved for the upkeep of the temple. The legendary Sphinx, also at Giza, is part of one of these necropolis. That built around the pyramid of King Khufu's son, Khafre. We may know the reason why the pyramids were built, but the origin of their specific shape is still uncertain. The earliest Egyptian burials involved placing the body in a shallow pit, then covering it with a large rock or mound of stones. These not only served to keep jackals from digging up the dead, but also were probably meant to represent the primordial mound from which the Egyptians believed all life sprang. The ancient Egyptians were oriented towards the Nile, which was the source of their life and their sustenance. And the Nile used to flood every year. After that was over, when the floods would recede, the land would become visible again. So that became a metaphor for creation. 
So the primeval mound was the first time the first land began to be seen when the first waters, the primeval waters, had begun to recede. And it was upon this primeval mound that the sun rose for the first time. Then this mound actually is the pyramid. It represents the, the primeval mound, that the God created whole Egypt through this mound. The symbol of this primordial mound was the sacred Benben, a pyramidal shaped stone that most Egyptologists believe would later influence the form of the pyramids. And in the top of the pyramid, the capstone is a Benben. Then the capstone that they put it in the top of the pyramid and they cast it with electrum, white gold and uh, yellow gold. And that capstone is a symbol that the pyramid is finished. But some other scholars cite additional influences for the shape of the pyramids. One Egyptologist has a provocative new theory, based on a migration of desert people into the Nile Valley over 5,000 years ago, at exactly the time when pyramids began to be built. According to the theory, the newcomers brought knowledge of the desert landscape with them that might have affected the pyramid's form. A very important thing in the Western Desert is the fact that the only landforms that persist everywhere are conical or pyramidal landforms. Pointed hills is the main persisting landscape. These are uh, three conical structures in the middle of the desert, some 300 miles west of the Nile. The ancient Egyptians would have seen these things and would have wanted to build their structures that would remain in the windy environment in that form. So these natural landforms can definitely become, in my mind, the precursors to the pyramids. But before actual pyramids were built, Egyptian tombs went through another stage of development, the mastaba. Mastabas were low trapezoidal structures with sloping sides and flat roofs. Usually made of mud bricks, they developed from the primordial mound burials. Mastaba, and it's the Arabic word for bench, but they're bigger than any bench. But the mastaba is the word for the superstructure of a private tomb. The Egyptian tomb really consists of two parts. There's the below ground part, which is the actual burial chamber, and there is the above ground part, which could be cut into the cliff, or it could be a constructed monument like a mastaba. With mastabas, the Egyptians had taken the first step towards the classic pyramid. The next stage came around 2630 BC, during the Egyptian Third Dynasty, during the reign of King Djoser, when Djoser's high priest and architect, Imhotep, began building the famous Step Pyramid at Saqqara. The Dynasty Three, which is before Dynasty Four, there was a genius architect, his name is Imhotep. And he began to make a revolution in building, uh, changing the building from mud brick to limestone. And he built what's called the step pyramid, a mastaba above the one until he reached six mastabas. And that was a revolution. Soaring to almost 200 feet in height, with a base measuring 397 by 358 feet, the step pyramid is thought by many scholars to be the first large building in human history made completely of stone, and the first pyramid of any kind built in Egypt. Imhotep remains one of the few overseers of a pyramid whose name is still known. Exactly how he designed and planned the structure is not. We have from later times a uh, papyrus where they planned a temple and they knew in advance how many people they would need, how many food they would have to bring to the place and how many stones would be needed. And so there must have been similar papers for all these pyramids, but unfortunately we don't have them. However, we do know how the workmen actually accomplished the construction. To move the stone, they used levers, wedges, and rope, usually pulled by teams of men, chanting, at uh, heaving at a one, two, three, heave sort of thing. To cut the stone, they used uh, copper chisels, which are softer than modern iron chisels, but limestone is a soft stone. Of course, it takes a lot of work, but they had the manpower to do it. The result is a monument that is as precise as it is imposing.
Despite the remarkable symmetry of the final structure, however, archaeological investigations have proven that Imhotep did not plan for the monument to be a step pyramid from the beginning. He started with a mastaba, then he built a larger mastaba, and then he started piling them one on top of the other, so you have as though you have a stairway to heaven. Why the step pyramid was enlarged in these stages remains unknown. As magnificent an edifice as the step pyramid was, few later pharaohs copied it. Instead, they soon moved on to a new form, one that provided new challenges to their builders, and that would change the shape of the pyramids forever. The designer of the step pyramid, Imhotep, was so revered that in later centuries he was worshipped as a god. Egyptian pyramids will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to Egyptian pyramids on Modern Marvels. Just over a half century after King Djoser built the Step Pyramid in 2630 BC, King Snefru came to the throne of Egypt. He would become the greatest pyramid builder in Egyptian history. Unsatisfied with his early efforts, Snefru erected no less than three huge pyramids during a reign that may have lasted up to 50 years. The first was the so-called Collapsed Pyramid at Meidum, begun around 2575 BC. During its building, Snefru decided to change the form of the Collapsed Pyramid several times. Why he did so remains unknown. How he did it is understood much more completely. It was built as a step pyramid originally, which was then increased in size. Then King Snefru, the inventor of the true pyramid, decided to change it into four smooth sides that met at a point high in the sky. And for me, that was the most amazing uh, feat that I've seen in, in my studies. Because if you deviate the angle of one side, even a little bit on the bottom, it will be exaggerated as you rise to the top and they never meet. You never get to the pyramidion, to the apex. Today, all that is visible of this pyramid is part of its inner stepped core, surrounded by heaps of loose rubble, thus giving it its collapsed appearance. In earlier times, archaeologists believed that it had indeed collapsed during construction and was for this reason abandoned. But later research indicates that the pyramid was successfully completed, then was systematically stripped of its casing. Over the ages, that exterior was uh, quarried, used for other buildings. Whole cities could be built from the stone that had been gathered there for the pyramids. And uh, that accounts for its present appearance. Like the step pyramid completed 55 years earlier, the core of the collapsed pyramid was made with layers of stone that actually leaned inward. The step pyramid of Meidum was built with what was called accretion layers. They are layers of stone that are built circumferentially around a core. And they lean in, actually. One thing that is known for certain is that at some point during its construction, the collapsed pyramid was temporarily abandoned. For reasons that we do not know, in year 17, he left this pyramid completely unfinished and he built in Dahshur the pyramid that we call it now the Bent Pyramid. The Bent Pyramid is really constructed. They started 54 degree and they could not continue. They had to switch the angle. The Bent was the first pyramid designed from the beginning to be a true smooth-sided pyramid. Part of the reason it still looks that way is because, unlike almost all the other pyramids, most of its exterior casing stones remain in place. With a base measuring 617 feet square and a height of 345 feet, the Bent Pyramid is considerably larger than both the Collapsed Pyramid and the Step Pyramid. However, soon after construction began, problems appeared. Problems that are still visible in the structure today. They built up ways and discovered that cracks were beginning to form internally and externally. So about halfway up, they changed the angle of the rise of the sides. The problem was the pyramid was built on a clay subsoil. It couldn't support the weight of the pyramid, and that was the reason for the cracking, but they didn't know it at the time. The method of laying the masonry on the upper portion of the pyramid was also modified. 
Instead of the earlier technique of the stones leaning inward to match the angle of the outer slope, the later courses were assembled in nearly horizontal layers. This was not only easier to accomplish for the workers and masons who built the pyramid, but also made the structure far more stable. With these engineering lessons learned, Snefru then undertook the building of a brand new pyramid, one that is still hailed as among the most beautiful and perfect pyramids ever constructed, the Red Pyramid. They went just one kilometer to the north and built this massive stone uh, building behind us, which is called the Red Pyramid, because of its appearance, uh, which is better to be seen in the morning light when all these uh, stones really have a red touch. With a base 772 feet square and a height of 345 feet, the Red Pyramid is more massive but no taller than the Bent Pyramid. With an angle of approximately 43 degrees, the slope of the Red Pyramid is also much shallower than the lower portion of its Bent cousin. The angle was an attempt to copy the upper angle of the Bent Pyramid because they felt that that was the safest angle to build a pyramid with. But structurally, the Red Pyramid's most important feature was the way in which its stones were assembled. The Red Pyramid was an advance over the earlier pyramids because the entire pyramid was built with courses of horizontal stone, a much more stable structure. All the forces are directly down instead of angled outwardly. The Red Pyramid of Snefru is the first pyramid that is actually a perfect pyramid that has achieved the pure abstract pyramidal form. No one knows exactly why Snefru built this edifice, but archaeologists have speculated that he wanted his final resting place to be an ideal expression of the pyramid, and the Red Pyramid is certainly that. With the construction of the Red Pyramid, all the major engineering and structural elements of the classic pyramid were put in place. The stage was set for Snefru's son, Khufu, to build the greatest pyramid of them all. Taken together, the three pyramids built by King Snefru contain a volume of stone almost a million cubic meters greater than the Great Pyramid. Egyptian pyramids will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to Egyptian pyramids on Modern Marvels. Near the modern city of Cairo lies the largest and most imposing concentration of pyramids in the world, those of the Giza Plateau. They include the biggest of them all, the Great Pyramid of Khufu, begun around 2551 BC, the Pyramid of Khufu's son, Khafre, the Pyramid of Khufu's grandson, Menkare, several smaller pyramids called Queen's Pyramids, and the legendary Sphinx. The site of Giza was uniquely suited for the construction of pyramids. It has the best quality of limestone. It's about 300 feet above the sea level. It's a perfect place. It has the best quality of the stones. And this type of stones never existed any place else. Giza was also less than a mile from the banks of the Nile making the movement of manpower and supplies to the site far easier. The Nile was the great artery of ancient Egypt. There were no roads per se, so the river was instrumental. Stone was shipped over the river in barges, not only limestone from one side of the river to the other side of the river, but granite, which came from hundreds of miles away to the south. Before construction of the Great Pyramid could begin, its builders had to find a way to make the site completely flat. Many Egyptologists believe that water was used. First, a shallow channel was dug around the site, then it was filled with water. Since the surface of the water would be exactly the same height in every part of the channel, the Egyptians only had to flatten the dry portions down to the level of the water. But not everyone agrees that this is how the site for the Great Pyramid was leveled. Martin Eisler is a sculptor who has studied Egyptian construction techniques for over 30 years. He has several provocative theories about the building of the pyramids, which are supported by decades of painstaking research and observation. I do not think that the Great Pyramid was leveled by means of water in any form. I think they did it with no more complicated a device than this instrument called a square level. 
it's, it's actually an A-frame, as you can see, with two legs and a plumb bob hanging from its apex. There's a mark in the center that tells where, when the object is level. You level a small area with this and erect two posts, perhaps seven feet apart. You mount a board on the post. You could take another post of equal height to the first two and place it at a distance. Using the board as a sighting rod, you could then cut drafts in the bedrock until the pole is at a level with the first two poles in the small area that you've cut. Let's call it the leveling area. This process could then be repeated until the entire base of the pyramid was leveled. Yet while experts may disagree on the methods used to level the Great Pyramid, they all agree that the results were remarkable. They did an astonishing job on leveling the Great Pyramid. It deviates by less than an inch from the northern corner to the southern corner, which is a fantastic accomplishment. The next stage was laying out the base. This was important because the orientation of the pyramid was crucial for religious reasons. You often read about how closely the pyramids are aligned to the cardinal points, north, south, east, and west, because as just as the pyramid points heavenward towards the sky, the sky is also anchored in the earth by the pyramids because the Egyptians associated the cardinal points with the circuit of the sun, with the sky, and with various constellations. The generally accepted theory is that the pyramids were oriented using stellar observations. By bisecting the angle between the points where a particular star rises and sets on the horizon, a direction of true north can be obtained. But other experts, including Martin Eisler, believe that a different method was used instead. It's very hard to point to a distant star and get the accuracy that they were able to achieve. I think they oriented the pyramids by means of the shadows cast by the sun. First, the builders would have placed a perpendicular stake, called a gnomon, in the ground. When equal and opposite angles of the sun cast shadows over a gnomon, the bisection of that angle gives you a north-south direction. Whatever the method, the Great Pyramid was aligned almost perfectly, its sides having a variance of less than one-fifteenth of one degree from the cardinal points. Other measurements were equally precise, each side measuring 756 feet, with a discrepancy of only four inches per side. In order to actually construct this gigantic edifice, the Egyptians faced an equally gigantic problem in human resources management. Contrary to the popular image, labor was not performed by hundreds of thousands of slaves, but by peasant conscripts as part of a corvée, that is, as labor owed the state by the peasants, probably as part of their taxes. People are taken from the farms from all over Egypt. They are brought to a centralized spot, let's say Giza. They work together in organized gangs directed by experienced masons and architects to uh, build this great pyramid, which becomes a symbol of national identity. The workforce lived and died in its own worker city, right at the site which was only discovered and excavated in the early 1990s. Based on the evidence of our discovery of the size of the workmen camp, we believe only 20,000 workmen were actually involved in the construction of the pyramid. We believe that the, there was permanent workmen, and this could be like 6,000. Those are actually the workmen who make statues, uh, making technical work, draftsmen, craftsmen, and things like this. But the workmen who move the stones could be 15,000, and they work in rotation. They change them every three months. These workers were further divided into smaller units called crews. A crew consists of 2,000 workmen, and they divide the crew, the 2,000, to two gangs. Each gang consists of 1,000 workmen. Each gang had a name like friends of Khufu, and each gang has an overseer. They divide each gang to uh, five file. A file is a Greek word, means tribe, group. 
Each group consists of 200 workmen. And they had names like great ones, green ones. And after that, they divide them to small units, 10 to 12 workmen. Near the workers' quarters, their graveyard has also been discovered. One of the overseer's tombs was even made in the form of a small pyramid, complete with an underground passageway and burial chamber. The overseers lived a relatively long life, but the common laborers who died at the site did so at significantly younger ages. All the age of the workmen were between 30 to 35 years old. But the artisans, their ages were between 40 to 45. And this gives us an idea about the levels of the workers' community. The artisans were not carrying stones, were not pulling up stones, they just carving, and it was a light work. But these people who are, were buried down, they worked in a hard work in, in constructing the pyramids. The workers were kept supplied by a small army of merchants and tradesmen who transported their goods to Giza by boat. Also, in order to feed them, farms have to be established, new areas of land have to be cultivated in order to do this. There has to be a means of uh, taking the products, the food, and getting them to Giza and storing them there and redistributing them. But immense projects such as the Great Pyramid had far larger effects than simply building a monument for a dead king. In some ways, you can say that the great pyramid building projects built the Egyptian state because an enormous amount of organization was involved. It was their space program. It was the Apollo program of the past, where it get all of these people to work together so they can feel great and they can have an accomplishment. And they did, and it became one country since then. It would be this workforce that would complete the largest engineering project yet undertaken in human history. The ancient Greek historian Herodotus reported incorrectly that the Great Pyramid was built by shifts of a hundred thousand slaves and that King Khufu forced his daughter into prostitution to help pay for the massive project. Egyptian pyramids will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to Egyptian pyramids on Modern Marvels. The workers who quarried the majority of the building stones for the pyramids at Giza labored at a site that has only recently been cleared of debris. Actually, all the stones for building the Great Pyramid came from a location of a quarry next door to the Great Pyramid, about 600 feet from the base of the pyramid. And we discovered this location. There's a grid pattern in the ground from which blocks were removed. There were trenches built in grids they dig down the trenches, they were about two feet wide, and then they'd split a layer of stone off. And they did this layer by layer, so that there's a bluff above the pyramid now that must be 20, 25 feet high. Workers used simple copper tools, like these preserved in the Cairo Museum, to rough out the limestone blocks. Afterwards, using tools much like these, Masons smoothed the sides and edges of the blocks. Then, employing wooden sleds and ropes such as this, the blocks were dragged to the pyramid. Most scholars believe that the workers piled up the blocks in sequential horizontal layers, with each layer being precisely squared and leveled until the top of the pyramid was reached. But again, not all the experts agree. Number one, the slightest imperfection on the bottom would assume a cumulative effect as it reached the top. In addition, when I looked at the Great Pyramid, I could see that almost none of the courses were truly level. And I realized then that this was not the way to go. There had to be another approach. And uh, this is what I devoted many years to finding. Using the collapsed pyramid as a prototype, Eisler proposes that most pyramids built after the collapsed pyramid consist of three stages of construction. First, an inner stepped core, not unlike the core of the collapsed pyramid was built. Then, the base was enlarged, and the large steps were progressively filled in with a second layer of smaller steps, creating a shape much closer to a true pyramid. Finally, the small stepped exterior was encased in a layer of finely finished limestone, creating a true smooth-sided pyramid. Because so much of the original stone remains on the Great Pyramid, 
It is impossible to tell if this three-stage process was used in its construction. But as evidence for his theory, Eisler points to a number of smaller pyramids, called Queen's Pyramids, that stand alongside the large pyramids at Giza, and which were built at about the same time. And the remains there show Dukli's large steps, which were then filled in with what we call packing stones, which were smaller stones and brought it to a more pyramidal shape. And finally, this whole thing was encased with a mantle of smooth limestone that met at a point in the top. There are also several theories concerning how the stones were raised to the height of the upper courses. Most of them involve the construction of ramps that either spiraled around the pyramid as it grew or led directly to the current level of construction. The ramp that the Egyptian used to construct the pyramid was huge, constructed of a stone rubble and mud. Then when the Egyptian will dismantle this ramp, they had to leave evidence under the ground of that ramp. I did excavate on the south side and the surprise was discovering a small section of the ramp. But some experts, including Martin Eisler, believe that if a large ramp was employed, its remains would be far more evident. You can't erase a ramp that may have reached a height of 500 feet. The remains would be obvious by aerial photography. Mr. Eisler does think ramps were used, but only on the lower, more easily accessible levels of a pyramid. For the higher stages, he believes another method was employed. I believe they got the stones up the pyramid by putting a slideway of planks along the side and pulling the stone by a crew of men who are located up the pyramid and snubbing the rope around a log which is further up the pyramid. The whole process can be aided considerably by using levers as the stone is elevated so that with the aid of levers and with the aid of crews of men standing uphill, I believe they could pull the stones into position. Indeed, at many pyramids, notches in the building stones which may have been used for the placement of levers are still visible. Though controversial, the idea of pulling and levering the stones into place does address the shortcomings of the various ramp theories. But as of yet, no one knows for certain exactly how the ancient Egyptians a society that didn't even possess the wheel accomplished this remarkable feat of engineering. Once all the blocks were in place, the Great Pyramid was capped with a triangular piece of granite meant to represent the sacred Benmen stone, symbol of the primordial mound, much like this one which was found at Giza, which may have been coated with a hammered-on layer of gold. Then, using the same methods that were employed to raise and place the other stones, the body of the pyramid was covered with a casing of fine white limestone. Shimmering in the desert sun, the final appearance of the pyramid must have been spectacular, giving those who worked on it an immense sense of pride. Its final height was 481 feet, making it the tallest structure in the world until the Cologne Cathedral of Germany topped it in 1880. The pyramid contains an estimated 2.3 million blocks of stone, each weighing up to two and a half tons. Many archaeologists believe that the entire process took almost 23 years. As impressive as the exterior of the Great Pyramid is, its interior is equally remarkable. As in the case of all earlier pyramids, there are a series of tunnels and chambers. The interior arrangements of the Pyramid of Khufu are elaborate. There are three burial chambers, and it is not agreed today whether there are supposed to be three, it was intended from the beginning, or whether they were revising their plans. Because of these multiple chambers, and the fact that the pyramid was looted of its contents long ago, no one knows for certain exactly where Khufu was buried. But what is believed to be the true burial chamber of the king is reached by a long passageway, which then turns into an immense ascending gallery the so-called Grand Gallery, a corbelled passageway nearly 150 feet long and 26 feet high. Corbelled means that the headers or short ends of the blocks get successively closer and closer and closer, so you're looking at a sort of inverse stairway, which finally comes together way up in the distance on high. Finally, the Grand Gallery leads to the heart of the Great Pyramid. 
Because this chamber is the only one of the three within the pyramid that contains a sarcophagus, most scholars believe that this is where King Khufu was actually buried. It is lined entirely with granite. That's a wonderful thing. Granite being a stone that was charged with solar associations because it's red for one reason. 30 feet by 15 feet and nearly 18 feet high. The roof of the king's chamber consists of several massive granite slabs, each weighing more than 70 tons. Above this, there are also a series of false roofs that were designed to reduce the enormous weight pressing down on the chamber from above. They have worked brilliantly for over 40 centuries. Khufu had willed the construction of the greatest engineering marvel of the ancient world. However, the completion of the Great Pyramid didn't end the building on the Giza Plateau. Indeed, it was only the beginning. The only known figure of the ruler who built the greatest pyramid on Earth is a tiny statuette of King Khufu, no more than three inches high. Egyptian pyramids will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to Egyptian pyramids on Modern Marvels. The second large pyramid on the Giza Plateau was built by Khufu's son, King Khafre. Begun around 2520 BC, it was constructed using the same basic methods as those employed on the Great Pyramid. Its base is 705 feet on each side, and it rises to a height of 471 feet, only 10 feet shorter than the Great Pyramid. But because it is built on ground that is 33 feet higher than the Great Pyramid, it appears to be even taller. Due to its smaller base, it also rises at a sharper angle than the Great Pyramid, over 53 degrees to the Great Pyramid's 51 degrees. And another reason it looks different is that at the very top of it, we have the original fine casing stones that have been left there. So it has a very different profile. The inside of Khafre's pyramid is different as well. Unlike the Great Pyramid's complex system of tunnels, shafts, and chambers, Khafre's pyramid has a relatively simple internal plan, consisting of two passageways that converge on a single burial chamber. The colossal statue behind me represents my serenus or Men Khao Re, who built the third pyramid and pyramid complex at uh, the Giza necropolis. With a base of 335 by 343 feet, Menkare's pyramid rises to a height of 213 feet, at an angle of slightly more than 51 degrees, making it considerably smaller than Khafre's pyramid. It also has a building mass less than one-tenth that of the Great Pyramid. But it only looks small when you compare it with those, because the pyramid of Menkare is huge. It's as big as the Step Pyramid. The pyramid has the distinction of being clad in its bottommost courses of granite rather than limestone, so it would have been more colorful. Why the pyramids at Giza got progressively smaller remains unknown. But scholars speculate that the enormous cost of these massive building projects simply could not be sustained by the kings who followed Khufu. Of all the monuments connected to the pyramids, perhaps none is as remarkable as the mighty Sphinx. A huge stone lion with the head of a man, its design, construction, and purpose has been the source of heated controversy for centuries. The Sphinx, I think, is compelling because it's this part human, part uh, animal form, and it provides this mysterious air. It's not quite completely all there. Uh, it's this huge structure on the Giza Plateau. Uh, what in the world could it have been about? We know that uh, from where it is, that uh, most likely it was uh, done during the time of the builder of the second pyramid, the King Khafra. And this is because of the orientation of the Sphinx itself. And some people even perceive that the face of the Sphinx itself looks like the statue of uh, King Khafra. 240 feet long and 66 feet tall, the Sphinx was the first truly colossal piece of sculpture in ancient Egypt. Its builders began by quarrying a U-shaped ditch out of a solid limestone base of the Giza Plateau. Then, they sculpted the body from the block of stone that made up the center of the U, making the bulk of the monument actually part of the plateau itself. A recent theory makes an even more direct link between the Sphinx and the natural landscape. I really think if you look at the setting of the Sphinx, you can see that it is more 
part of that environment that most people give it. Why do I say that? It's because we see things like that almost identical to it in the Western Desert due to total natural erosion. These natural features are called mud lions. This here is a yard egg, or a mud lion, or a natural sphinx. There are huge numbers of these in the Western Desert in Egypt. And that's why I'm saying that the ancient Egyptian may have borrowed that uh, shape from this natural landform, knowing that it is part of the majesty of the land. For hundreds of years, there have been rumors of secret tunnels and chambers within the Sphinx. Not long ago, those ideas were put to the test with ground-penetrating radar. And they did survey the whole area, and it proved that there is nothing really underneath the Sphinx. The Sphinx is a solid rock or a living rock, and there is nothing really is hidden inside. A sense of how ancient and revered this monument is can be gained from the fact that its first restoration was undertaken almost 1,100 years after Khafre died by Pharaoh Tutmos IV in and around 1400 BC. A 12-foot tall, 15-ton granite stele erected by Tutmos at the site relates the story of how, as a young prince, but not the crown prince, he was on a hunting expedition near the Sphinx. Pausing for a rest, he fell asleep in the shadow of the statue's head, which was then the only part of the monument that remained above the encroaching desert sands. And the Sphinx came to him in his dream and said, My son, Tutmos, I'm dying because of the sand. If you remove the sand away from my head, I will make you the king of Egypt. And this prince actually became the king of Egypt. Then Tutmos, as a matter of fact, is the first archaeologist on earth. And he's the first one who restored the Sphinx. The Sphinx was built to guard the pyramids for all eternity. And yet, as imposing as it is, it has failed to ward off the predations of man. Because of the fabulous riches contained within the pyramids, all of them, without exception, were broken into and looted by tomb robbers long ago. Indeed, in many cases, later archaeologists were able to find the interior passageways of a pyramid simply by following the tunnels dug by thieves, such as this one in Menkare's tomb at Giza. Some have speculated that this is the reason why the building of large pyramids declined so rapidly after the Golden Age of the Fourth Dynasty. Others take a different view. I personally believe that they stopped doing the pyramids because the country was unified. Because if we agree to this premise that uh, Khufu had actually gotten these people to feel great about building this together and becoming one people, then from there on it, is, it became a matter of a burial site and that's no big deal. So I started making little ones. The attention shifted from the size of the pyramid to the development of the complexes attached to the pyramid so that the pyramid temples expanded and became more complicated and the valley temples expanded and became more complicated. After that, pyramids got increasingly smaller and uh, it just sort of faded out. Ironically, most of these later pyramids, such as the Black Pyramid at Dashur, were made with a core of mud bricks to speed their construction then faced with a layer of limestone. Once the limestone was plundered for other construction projects, they quickly eroded, leaving them in a greater state of disrepair than the earlier stone pyramids. As long as the pyramids have stood, and as much as they have been studied, new research promises to unravel even more of their ancient riddles. New techniques of analysis and investigation are developed and can be applied and we find out new things all the time because of that. So that the pyramid field is never exhausted. Yet, even as new theories are examined and old ones discarded, the pyramids will continue to maintain their compelling allure. I remember when I first uh, saw the pyramids, it was in fact as a graduate student, I was flying in to do research, and our plane passed uh, over them, and I saw them from the air, and I got to admit, I got teary-eyed. And I'm sure uh, that we'll know more, because I always say to people that you never know what the sand of Egypt might hide of secrets. Some secrets of the pyramids may remain locked within their stony embrace until even they succumb to the passage of time. But even as new knowledge sheds light on their ancient mysteries, the Egyptian...